Hello everyone, Editing Ryan here. It is not customary for mine to be the first voice you hear in an episode. I am not here to do the intro, but rather give you all a disclaimer. Episode 27 is the first episode to feature more than three individuals in the studio. Because of this, the microphone had to be calibrated in a different format than what it usually is. As a result, the audio will sound a bit different from what you are accustomed to, and various additional noises may be heard every now and then that normally would not. Noises like a chair creaking or my neighbor's dog barking. If you hear these things, you are not going crazy, I assure you. But that is the reason why. I will now get out of your way. Enjoy episode 27. the Kindred Spirit Podcast, a show all about the board game Spirit Island. Here, we'll talk about analytics and strategies with it in game, as well as a plethora of other topics that can be found within it. In today's episode, we are going to dive into our preferred methods of play and our thoughts on each module. And as a special treat, we have two <laughs> guests today. <laughs> Laura, which we all know. Yeah. Uh, no, back. no need for more introduction. And for the first time ever, Tim! Hey! Tim! Hey, that's me! I'm Tim. <laughs> well, you're not wrong. <laughs> <laughs> Today is an actually a unique episode because oh. this is the first time that John I took is the taking range. the range. Yeah. yeah. So this is going to be quite unique and fun, I think. So are you oh, ready? Wait. Before we get started, can I start the episode with ooh, a ooh. little special? <gasps> What's yes. up? All right. Hey! <laughs> <laughs> I was going to try that one out. Now we can first How do you feel? Awesome. Do you feel good? Dude, I don't love it. Great. Okay. <laughs> All righty then. <laughs> This is like so surreal for me because <laughs> it was just a habit that I did. You know, I didn't. You have fans, it. Ryan. Oh, this is so weird. My impact in the, the world is bops. actually discernible and visible right in front of my face. So yeah, John, would you like to describe to everyone who's listening what oh. is going on here? We're talking about all the different ways you can play Spirits Islands and how cool it is that there are different difficulty modulars, and we'll get into that. That how you can play the game, where you can play with different cards or different adversary scenarios. Areas. We're going to break it down, but you can make this game how difficult or easy you want it to be. The difficulty modules. Yes. The ways that you can make the game easier and harder. Most games only have a few. This game has a ton. You can stack a lot of them towards the easier side. You can stack a lot of them towards the harder side. You can have them clash. You can have none of them. And that's one of the things that for me, honestly, that was probably one of the cooler things about this game because mm. that told me as a beginner player just how replayable this is going to be. Because I can be like, oh, check this out. Oh, check that out. And I remember when I was looking through the cards and I'm like, wait, wait, what's this card? Oh, wait, what's this thing? And, oh, that's a way that you can increase the difficulty. No, okay, well, maybe later. <laughs> what about this? Oh, this is just another way that you can increase the difficulty. No, okay, maybe, maybe later. What about this thing? Oh, this is just yet another, you know? <laughs> so it's just like with the Lamba spread, like... Ooh, difficulty modules. And look, <laughs> more <laughs> difficulty <laughs> modules. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> well, for a game where it is you playing against the board, I think you need that replayability and to ramp it up. It's not human versus human. Right, mm. in a co-op game, yeah. Yeah, it's helpful in that way. It kind of promotes growth. I mean, when you have like a PvP kind of game, right, you're going to grow because your opponents are getting better. But if your opponents are a board or a cards, you know, they're not actually going to get better unless you're introducing new cards. New board right. kind of stuff. Which yep. may I ask an aside? One of our first games that we played that was co-op was Predators. The Legendary Alien. Encounters. That Legendary was it. Encounters. Legendary yep. Encounters. That was the day I met you. What? Whoa! So. It was my birthday. We made taco pizza. Oh yeah. My oh my gosh. This I was is just like going full circle. <laughs> <laughs> it was one of the first games. It was like, oh my gosh, we're all playing this together against yeah. this board. Did that one have difficulty modules? I don't own it. I mean, I've only played it like twice, so um, I don't remember being. Tim, you know nothing. So. I know none of it. <laughs> <laughs> I was. There. You were there. <laughs> I was there. <laughs> you were just there for the pizza, right? It's, it was delicious pizza, I'm telling you. <laughs> I believe so. I can't quite remember because it's just simply been a while since I played that game, but I believe one of the easy modules for that game is the players can get an extra turn at the start, or to make it harder, you don't get an extra turn at the start, but rather the bad guys get a turn ahead of you instead. But that's about it, really. Hey, okay. this is the Kindred Spirit podcast. <laughs> right? I was just wondering. Let's put that into a little it bit of context. We've referenced games before. <laughs> so anyway, Sentinels. <laughs> 
So sponsored by Grand Games. <laughs> <laughs> I oh, wait for our phone call. <laughs> Contact us at the Kindred Spirit Podcast at gmail.com. <laughs> so what are these various difficulty modules? Well, let's get into it and talk about the impact that they have. Some a little bit less than others, some a little bit more than others. And we've talked about many of these before, but if you are curious what these various difficulty modules are, sit back, relax, and here we go. Of the many, probably the one that is the least used is the power card plan. This is the one where when you would go and grab a new power, whether minor or major, instead of just simply grabbing four and picking one like you normally would, instead there is this what I call a power card plan where the first power card you get, there is a simple list and you just straight up get that one card. There's no randomness. You just straight up search for it, find it, put it in your hand. This means it is extremely more streamlined Mm -hmm. for the newer player because it's just simply going to be there. Heck, there is no worrying about, wait, which one do I pick? I don't know which one to pick. Uh, Don't worry. It's chosen for you already. And I shall also say this is exclusively for the low complexity peeps. Have you ever seen with your major minor power cards in the deck where the corners have various colors? The corners on the top left and bottom right have a yellow sash or a blue or a red or a green. Well, those are simply to connotate which cards are on the power card plan. That way, if you want to, you can go and sift all of them out of the deck to quickly find them and plop down in front of you so you can make this even faster. Has anyone played? I haven't with that. I have done it a single time. Okay. Which spirit? That was my very first game when I did two-handed with Earth and Lightning. Okay. Okay. At the very beginning. Lord, but you? I think I might have done it on Steam during COVID of last year. Okay. But I don't remember. Timmy? No, I didn't know this was a thing for a while. Um, it was kind of fun to hear about it. I never played this way. I personally, I don't think I would want to. I think it's kind of designed for people who are newer to just like board games in general. Yep. Right? Mm-hmm. But like having a background of like playing yep. plenty of games before, I feel like it's a bit too limiting. Right? Mm. I kind of wanted to get the experience of it, figuring out right. which cards synergize with my spirit. Mm. I think another reason why it's not really too common is because it's only available for four spirits. Mm. And if you're not playing any of those spirits, then you kind of can't do this. <laughs> you no, know, I'd be interested to see if like someone online has come up with their own like kind of power track for other spirits. I feel like it'd be Ooh. really fun. Rampant Green do. Jungle Hungers, yes. <laughs> <laughs> oh my word, if you like, gave Rampant Green Jungle the... Hungers from the oh, start. Yeah. Oh my word. That'd be so unfair. Uh, I love it. First card jungle. <laughs> oh, that's great. Yeah. Tim, I think that's a great idea. And Thanks, if somebody Tim. puts that out I there, don't. I will play it. <laughs> I think that's a dumb idea. Hey, oh, I'll see you guys later. <laughs> <laughs> I think it could be fun and cool, but people would use it after their second yeah. game. It's something cool to do in your free time, though. John giving yourself Storm Swath of Lightning yes, turn one. Like, yes! I would, yeah, I would stack the deck. <laughs> but right, I already yeah. Storm. Whee! Finder just get weave first card. <laughs> you know, what great. could be kind of interesting, I don't know, maybe this is a terrible idea, is like instead of stacking the deck... That is a of, terrible idea. I hate oh it. Alright. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for no. coming on. Yeah, <laughs> no, instead of like stacking the deck in your favor, almost like picking powers that you normally wouldn't pick with that spirit, but that might be making it too hard. So who knows? What is too hard? What's too mm-hmm. easy? Let's get into difficult <laughs> <laughs> oh, One more word in that defense. Sometimes you're like, I want to play, say, Thunder Speaker, and I want to play leveled up Thunder Speaker oh. with all of the best cards and just mm-hmm. get that power trip. So maybe going through and kind of pre-planning your progression as Thunder Speaker mm-hmm. in order to mm-hmm. just get that feeling of like, yes, I am the best. At the beginning of Force Unleashed, you like play Darth Vader and you just have <laughs> unlimited power type of thing, but then just chucking Wookiees everywhere. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> first, I'm like, this game's incredible. And then you get to play yeah. Star Killer. Yeah. Star Killer. Oh, like, my health bar is tiny. <laughs> <laughs> so that'd be funny. I guess I kind of feel like I haven't played this game a ton, mind you. What? I'm not a professional here. <laughs> that right? <will> change. <laughs> <laughs> but I feel like even in the small amount of time I play, there have been a handful of turns where I'll kind of be like, like, all right, I'm going to take a power here, but I really, really need, like, a defend card. Like, I'm looking for a defend Oh, my card. goodness, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Like, I really need, like, a push oh, yeah. card. It's something that works with the Han. Like, that's yeah. what I'm looking for. And so when I draw four cards, I have an option. Hopefully one of them is going to be what I'm looking for. Mm-hmm. When you have that power track, even though it's considered to make it easier, is it really easier if you, like, guaranteed not going to get what you need? Right. Ooh, Josh would point. agree with you, too, by the way. Ooh. Callback from one of our yeah. 
previous. He also time. argued that it's not so great for the game state when the fluctuating changes and needs of your board don't match this power card plan. He's like, hey, I got a Dahan card, and he was like, all my Dahan are dead. <laughs> <laughs> so it doesn't really help me right now. I'm great doing power. normal power card acquisition rules. I could just grab something else that may be more helpful than this Dahan using card. So anyway, the power card plan can only be used by the four low complexity peeps, and they do make the game a little bit easier. Then there's the blank card. Yes or no? The blank card simply adds a conditionary effect to the players that will happen. It could be good, it could be eh, it could mm-hmm. be bad, and it will come into play if the island is blighted too many times. So this will add the pressure, the tension to the game so long as you can keep the board healthy, you're fine. But if it's kind of blighting, you have this tension because there's going to be a new thing. Is it good? Is it bad? I don't know. One way to make the game slightly easier is to actually pick your blight card so that you know what it's going to be. And if you want an easier game, make it like a beneficial one. Or if you want to eh, kind of be normalist, make sure it's maybe like a eh one, but never make it like a terrible one. That'd be a way to make the game easier. Usually speaking, I love keeping a random blight card because okay. I have no idea. I want to have absolutely no idea what my blight card is going to be. Furthermore, simply having a blight card in the game will make it slightly harder because you have no idea what this effect is. And so at first, you're kind of like, it could be bad. Statistically, it's probably bad because mm-hmm. there's only two in the entire game that are good. And I got one one. <laughs> <laughs> hey. <That's> crazy. <laughs> Was it back against the wall or eight from lesser spirits? It's eight, eight from, from lesser, lesser spirits. I think I yeah. like that one the most, just because thematically I like it better. But back against the wall is so ridiculously good. good. Another There's energy, and another card play. Bad. Oh my word. Probably actually the stronger of the two, but I like the lore of the other one. Yeah, the thematics of Eight from Lesser Spirits, like, helping you out. Yeah. But if you want to have a slightly easier game, don't have a Blight card, and you will have a massive Blight threshold. You'll have five per player. That's insane. Which is insane, instead of two per player. So if all four of us around the table here were going to play a game with a Blight card, we would have nine Blight. And that, of course, is because of the new Errata change, where we get a single additional Blight for the Blight card now. But if we were to go and not play with the blight card, we would have like 20 bucks. Wow. <laughs> so when you have that amount, it's like, oh geez, we're invincible. <laughs> not I'll, literally, but I'll you get welfare. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> you can kind of think of it because once the island blights, you do add blight back onto the card. If I understand correctly, most of the blighted island cards are like add three. Unless it's something really bad, then you add like four. But if it's yeah. something really good, you only add two. Yes. The worse the effect, the higher the blight threshold. But it's the exact opposite too. If it's a not bad ability, then then your blight threshold is going to be like two. So it's not going to be bad at all. So then the next difficulty thing is events. We recently spoke about this, and if you'd like to hear more about it in depth, check out our past episode number 24, The Great Event Debate. Which, by the way, I'm still (laughs) not on board with this (laughs) job. I like like events. We moved on from that, right, John? We healed our wounds from it. Oh, yeah. My bloody nose is all healed up. (laughs) Usually, the events will make it harder. And a certain Eric R. commented on episode 21, and not to flex, John, but this Eric R. said, it's not just you. Events are supposed to, on average, over time, be very slightly negative. Mm. To compensate for getting a starting disease and beasts on the board. I know some players view them as a bit better than that on average, but it can be really hard to judge. Also, Depends. take that, John. Never question me again. Um, <laughs> I talked about theme! I like the theme of them that make the living island. No, no, no. So did I. So did I. <laughs> but no, events are going to make it just a little bit harder. Unless you and have many you... minds or fangs. Yep. So if you want it to be a little bit harder, keep events in there. If you don't want it, kick them out. Next, scenarios. Ooh. Scenarios are really fun. They add a story to your game. If you want a plot and you want a mission an objective, something cool. Some of them add some really cool things. Some of them, they don't really add much, really. But each one of them has, like, a cool thematic story to it. So there is no Spirit Island campaign. Like, there's no scenarios in the rule book that you can flip and, oh, here's scenario three, scenario four. But like a legacy want, version or something? Yeah. In a way, uh, Second Wave can be. But if you want to, the player can go through and beat all the scenarios. And in a way, that can be your campaign. Usually speaking, scenarios will go and add difficulty. Some scenarios don't change the difficulty, and some of them can change it quite a lot. What I mean to say is that there are a plethora of different levels of scenarios. So some will be, oh, they'll add one difficulty to it, or it's difficulty two, or three. Mm -hmm. So 
you can go and to those who like to chart mathematically what the difficulty is on your game, you can be like, oh, because of this, that's plus one. This means plus two. This means plus three. So we had difficulty, whatever. So luckily in the scenarios case, I actually tell you what the difficulty mm. spike is for that. Then of course, there are adversaries, which Ooh. changes the bad guys to be a specific faction who behaves in a very specific way. So various strategies will change. Various stats will change on like how much health they have or how much damage they do. And they have a specific identity and theme to the nation that is coming against you. In a standard game, it's just some token white people coming and smacking Spirit Island. But if you want to have adversaries, they will increase the difficulty. And how much do they increase the difficulty? Well, as we've described many times before, those are also different levels of difficulty with them. So you can have them like a level three Scotland or a four or five. And obviously five is more than four, which is more than three. And so whatever you want, you can go and Maths. tweak it <laughs> to your... <laughs> what are you, British, calling it maths? <laughs> maths. Well, we it's have a math teacher too. with us. <gasps> you teach math? Yes. Get up. Oh, no. <laughs> He's educational. <laughs> <laughs> One thing that's cool with events, scenarios, and adversaries, and all these various difficulty modules, is that they're all stackable, which mm-hmm. is cool. So you can have mm-hmm. events active and scenarios active and adversaries active if you really want to just completely compound the difficulty to something that's like a and lot be higher. miserable. That's my <laughs> sort of place. John <laughs> loves it. I do. Yeah. So there I are... I hate myself. <laughs> different levels of adversaries. You can actually have multiple adversaries at the same time so that you can really kick it up. So it's like a (laughs) contingent of this faction and this faction both going against you if you really want to ramp up the difficulty. I think France plus England is insane because France you can only have so many towns and England just won't stop building. Building. (laughs) There are a lot of factions that just keep spitting towns. Towns. Habsburg I think might spit them almost as much. Because they build double. They literally build double the rate in inland lands. So France, Habsburg is really ugly because France is like, hey, you can only put seven towns per player Mm -hmm. and Habsburg's like, let's do that twice as bad. (laughs) (laughs) So if you're a slow spirit, it's just like... (laughs) (laughs) You can have multiple adversaries at differing levels and with certain combinations of adversaries reaching different levels of difficulty. Mm -hmm. You can see how flexible this web of difficulty spiking can be. So that's all fun. One thing that also is really cool is the realistic and thematic board. And I'm not sure. Have you ever played a game on the thematic board? Oh, I have. Oh, <laughs> you have? we'll get into oh. it. Hey, cool, sweet. So to those don't of talk you about it. <laughs> who don't have the game so. or haven't done it yet, the thematic board does, in fact, increase the difficulty by a little bit. Mm-hmm. And how, why does it actually increase the difficulty? What about it increases the difficulty? It's because the lands are structured in a little bit more realistic way. It's not as even. So the bad guys are more prone to clumping up in different lands. They're not as spread. They're more confined and conglomerated into certain spots. Is there some reason spirits... to complain about the thematic side of the board? Because Laura wants to literally take a sharpie. It's just <laughs> the borders, because there's so much beautiful detail, instead of on the normal side, it's it is just kind pattern. Of hard. Yeah. The other side, it's beautiful, it looks more like a map, but that means that the borders are harder to see. So I don't even want a sharpie. I want white paint to go through yeah, and just like map a, out a colorblind where, version. Where does <laughs> land six end and land seven begin? Because it's all right. marshland and nobody right. knows. That is why on the new edition of the Neoprene Playmat, they actually Ooh. went and outlined each land in a solid color. So if it's oh, a sand, it'll be yeah. like a light brown, and if it's wetland, it, there's a blue trim, and if it's a jungle, it's a green trim, and obviously for mountains, Well, I do have acrylic trim. paints, oh. babe, so <laughs> guess what? If there's a snow day tomorrow... But no, I do agree <laughs> with you, especially on the first edition, when you look at the back, it's like, there's so much here. Sometimes it's actually hard to tell. Is that a jungle or a wetland? Mm-hmm. Because yeah. here's a river among trees. I can't <laughs> really tell. <laughs> What's well, the green one, obviously. Wait, Wait, which green one? Green, that green. green. <laughs> green no, is red to me. <laughs> but it is beautiful, and it does make you feel like you are actually playing on more of an island. Yeah, and it's so really cool. I highly neat. recommend it. It's actually really dope, and I really like this touch where you can see in the artwork on the realistic side the starting positions of various spirits. Like Nightmare and Wildfire start in sand, so if you look on like the play mat, you can look at the various sands, and oh, there's Bringer, and he's in the sands, and oh. Oh, there's wildfire. They're in the sands too. And you look for, okay, where's Ocean's Hungry Grasp? They're just all on the outskirts, just on the island. You're like, okay, where's Keeper? Oh, there they are. Where's Fangs? Fangs are in the jungle. And you see, oh, wait, where's River? Oh, there they are. And they don't have Finder on there. 
And that actually <laughs> makes me disappointed. Oh. Because Finder apparently is like interdimensional. You need to find. There you her. go. Yikes. <laughs> Everyone, <laughs> there's, <laughs> there's going to be a lot of dad jokes on this one. Hey, hey. Don't worry about it. When I'm painting the borders tomorrow, I'll add in a little <gasps> tiny finder somewhere. Oh. There you go. <laughs> That's love. <laughs> Happy Valentine's Day. Oh, that's true. That was yesterday at the time of this recording. What? <laughs> Wait, what? Peek behind the curtain. <laughs> anyway, so the realistic and the thematic boards, they are slightly more difficult because they conglomerate and clump the bad guys into certain spots a little bit more than the arcade side of the board. And so some spirits are actually going to be more okay with that than other spirits, but in general, it's going to make it just a wee little bit harder. Also, one thing about the Jag Earth expansion when they added boards E and F was the fact that those are subtle replacements for B and D. Boards B and D are just a tad bit more swingy with their orientation than E and F. So that is also something to take into consideration. Boards B and D are just slightly more swingy. Tim, you However, know I would of course. definitely <laughs> highlight board D because we are all aware that board D has two crazy unique things about it. One, it has that northern wetland that goes all the way across the board to the inland. So if you get to that land, you can like touch every single land on the board. This is a cool and awesome thing. Nice. However, it's a double-edged sword because while that is a cool thing that it sums up, the awful thing is that it is one of two coastal wetlands. It is the only board in the entire game that has two of the same land on the coast. Ooh. Every single board in the game, except for D-board, has three separate different kinds of lands for lands one, two, and three on the coast. D-board, though, has one coastal jungle and two coastal wetlands, which means in the Invader deck, if you get the coastal lands card and then you get wetlands, it's that rough. can hit you really hard. That hit me really hard in our Russia game when I was Sharp Fangs, and it is not fun. <laughs> but the thing is, is I look at board D as like a healthy risk. Like, you know what? I'm going to roll the dice. Because if that never happens, hey, bask in the glory of this wonderfully long land that touches all the other ones. And you can be like, ha I can get to all the other ones from this land. So You play a lot when you're ocean on mm, board D. I do? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I just hand her the board. <laughs> Thanks you for go. looking out for me, babe. Yeah. Babe, gotcha, babe. Speaking of boards, there there are certain board orientations that can also increase or alleviate some difficulty as well. For instance, the more that you have multiple boards touching other boards on different edges, the easier it will be for you to get to other friends. Also easier for bad guys to get to you, but in this instance, it's actually better for a friend to get to you quicker mm -hmm. than a bad guy could. So if you had them all in a straight line, just all the boards in a straight line, that will be much harder than if they were in a big circle. Because if it's just in a line, there's only one guy that can help you if you're on the bookend and that's simply your neighbor. If you're in one of the middle you have a guy to your left and your right but those guys it's like, how you doing buddy? <laughs> I'm doing good. I'm dead. Help! <laughs> and so you're just shouting over each other and sometimes if you have a really crazy board you might restrict access that the invaders can get to you, yes, but also your friends can get to you and most of the time you want to have your friends able to have access to you. The new archipelago arrangement Ooh. is something that throws a little monkey wrench into this, which is instead of having Spirit Island as one big consolidated island, it is simply a network, a delta of multiple smaller islands. <laughs> And so oh, sometimes you can have two boards here and maybe like a third over here. And how it works is actually pretty cool. You have to make sure that the coasts are facing each other, those ocean tiles. And how it works is you are simply range two from one of your coastal lands to someone else's coastal land. So is if you cool? have a power card or a growth option that is at least range two, you can hop over specifically if it's from coastal land to coastal Too much land. too soon for Tim. Oh, no, I want to play that. That so actually awesome. sounds really cool. What? Should I think that do sounds that? totally dope. Maybe not when you like want to do <clears throat> difficulty 11 but <laughs> that sounds fun that would Spoilers. be a fun thing to try as like a standard game like a casual game yeah, yeah. yeah. one of those cash games yeah, yeah. Cash, like games. Cash, games. cash games cash games cash games another thing though that you can do along with jagged earth is extra boards so usually there is one board per spirit and so you just start on one board and you're like all right here i am they're the bad guys go one thing that you can do to increase the difficulty is instead of starting with one board, you start with two. You literally have twice as much space and no other friends start on that other board. That's just an empty board that you have to get to. Wait, what? Yeah. So it You didn't know this? <laughs> <laughs> so in the rule book, there are a few setup changes to accommodate this. It's not one for one, so not every single thing is going to be the same. And I'm not going to get into that here because that's going to be a different topic. But that's something that's new to make the game harder is you have extra boards to go and 
cover. That makes the game harder. Archipelago makes it harder mm-hmm. because it's not as easy to get access to your friends or to other boards. As a newer player, is this exciting <laughs> to hear about all this replayability and things you can touch on that you haven't even grasped yet? No. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> no, of course. Obviously, this sounds fantastic. Yeah. I mean, I've heard of some of this stuff before. Mm-hmm. I was aware of Archipelago, but I didn't know exactly how it played out. How it played out. It almost seemed like it was going to be different people playing their own little game. And I'm yeah. like, that seems kind of strange. Yeah. Like, I'm here to play with my friends. Oh, and then there's Lure, who's just like, range four of an inland land. Yo! <laughs> and he just chucks it. <laughs> Lure's sick. Uh, and find you just like, woohoo! Just Pan Am all over the... <laughs> Add a presence to any land. <laughs> nice. Okay. Nice. Yeah. And then there is the initial explore action of the invaders. Usually in a standard game, the bad guys get a single explore action on you before the game starts. You can make the game easier by not allowing that. And so you just set up the game. You don't do that and you start. That will make the game a lot easier. To make the game harder, you can give them an extra action so they get a explore and a build on you. And if you want to do it really hard, you can give them all three starting. So you just don't even play. (laughs) Just go ahead and lose. Sit in the corner and watch the board do its thing. I like the pain. Yep. <laughs> Simply giving the bad guys more of a head start makes it harder, and giving them less of a head start makes them easier. Mm-hmm. So there are a few unofficial difficulty modules that some people like to play with, and we've discussed only a few of them, and so these ones I'll just rifle off really quick, that some people like to do in addition to other difficulty modifiers so that the game is just ridiculously hard. So although there is no way to quantifiably chart how much harder or easier this makes it, like the numbers is kind of lost here because this isn't Mm -hmm. official but the point being it's definitely going to be harder so one of the unofficial ones is tweaking the invader deck this can go both ways giving yourself all of the invader cards not shuffling them and discarding one Mm -hmm. so that you have every single one of them that will make the game significantly easier because not only do you have more turns in the game but you also know exactly what's going to come up sometimes because there are four level one invader cards so if you had the sand the wetland and the mountain you know on turn four the jungle is coming Mm. and the same thing so if you've had on the stage two one if you've had every single land except for coastal lands and there's one left oh you know it's coming so this gets the player a little bit more foreknowledge and it gives you more time to Mm. act but if you want to make the game harder give yourself less invader card stuff most of the adversaries will do this automatically they will go and tweak the invader deck for you so that you have less turns that's what Brandenburg Prussia does as well well as changing the order that they go in. All the Escalation Stage 3 cards come to two lands at a time, so some adversaries are like, ha let's do that from the start. So, <laughs> instead of ramping up, it's like, we're already here. Yep. And so, that is one way that you can go and make the game either easier or harder. It's just the various tweaks that you can do. Obviously, in the standard game, you're supposed to take each deck, Escalation Stage 1, 2, and 3, respectively, shuffle them, burn one card, so you have no idea which one was burned, so you don't have perfect omniscience as which one will come at the end of each Escalation deck, and then you put them together, and that is what a normal game is. So, another thing you can do if you want it to be a little bit easier is to have the Explorer card face up. This is a way to make the game dramatically easier if you are constantly, constantly losing, and you're like, how in the world do I actually beat this game? I feel as if I know the rules, and I feel like I'm doing a good job, but yet I always lose. Mm -hmm. Well, this is one way you can make it just a wee bit easier. Most of the time, you're not going to be able to do much about that Explorer, because even if you know where it's coming, you're not going to be able to stop it unless maybe you're downpour, finder or keeper usually yes I know you can find a card that will give you a wilds token or something but if you want just that one little push just to help you a little bit you can go ahead and look at the explore card have it face up to make it just a wee little bit easier or if you want you can just keep it face down and that would be standard difficulty some people like to change how power card acquisition works where instead of grabbing four and pick one you grab two and pick one that way you literally have half as many that you can choose from and you can only pick one as usual but your selection is only from two or maybe three. That sounds miserable. Right. And Sorry. if you want to make the game easier, draw five, pick one. Draw if 50. You want... <laughs> pick one. Just pick whatever one you want. Sure. <laughs> so if you want to make it harder, grab less than four. If you want to make it easier, grab more than four. Another thing that is something I've heard about many times and something I've actually done oh. a few times. I've done one of these. I've never done the second. First one, minors only. Never grab a major. You only ever grab minors and that's it. That I 
have done before. I don't think that one's so hard. This will make the game slightly harder because you won't have any of those super strong, powerful cards that can really just board wipe, but you just have all these tiny cards. This one makes the game harder, but just slightly. The really tough one is starting hand only. And so what would happen if you would gain a power card? If you want to have some fun with it, you can say if you would gain a power card, reclaim one instead. Or if you want to go purist, just completely ignore it. If something says give you a power card, nothing happens. Just completely wasted. This will make the game significantly harder and you will be needing to reclaim a lot more often, which is why I understand some people like to do the whole, instead of getting a power card, if you would gain a power card, you just reclaim one instead. Okay. Mm-hmm. And if characters already had reclaim one, then you just reclaim two or something like that. So, of course, you can have less blight than you usual if you want to have it like really hard so some two per player have one per player oh. this will make the game harder or if you want to make it just even easier have more so if you want to have an easier game have more mm-hmm. room for error that you can have so that means the lower the blight threshold the easier and more relaxing it's going to be for the players and obviously the lower the blight threshold the harder it's going to be because your margin for error is a lot smaller another simple one that some people like to do in their games is to alter the ocean tile so that it is no longer a source of invaders this will make it so that that your coasts will be just a little bit less populated and they won't be as aggressively explored by the bad guys. And then last but not least that some people have done is your reclaim all action with growth option one is now reclaim half. And if a character had reclaim half already, it's unaffected. So this one isn't crazy. This one's not so bad because you can pad this one out with a lot of cards when you gain new power cards at least. But still, you have to think about which one you get back. Anyone who has played Starlight's like, this is just normal life. Because <laughs> yeah. this is what Starlight has. Starlight has reclaim half. So you can't just grab all of them back, you have to actually pick and choose. So some people have liked to take that approach to every character, and that will make the game notably and discernibly harder than usual. But those last two that I mentioned were in fact unofficial, and they have no trackable difficulty increase or decrease. It will just be a nebulous improvement or detriment to you. So, there are the various modules in the game. So if you want to have the easiest game, the absolute easiest game, in episode 20 I said that there were eight easy modifiers. Three of them were Escalation State Stage one, two, and three. So if you have each card in each of those decks, there's three. You have the power card plan. That's another one. You don't have a blight card. That's another. And then make sure that you don't have any of those extra things. No events, no scenarios, no adversaries. Make sure that the ocean does not count as a source of invaders. Mm. And then, of course, you have the explore card face up. Mm. And then you don't have the bad guys have a initial explore. That's probably going to be your easiest game that you're going to have. So there you go. Tim, I want to pick your brain a little bit. All righty. Just like hearing all that and all the different variations. You owe me a quarter every time you say already. <laughs> <laughs> Briefly, just give us like a gaming background, at least in board gaming. Are yeah, you, who are you? Oh. <laughs> Why are you here? I? We found who Tim wandering on the side I? of the road, and now Two, he's here. Four, six, well, so you seem to be like really receptive. This is, I'm guessing you've played a lot of board games. I've <laughs> never played a board game in my life. Oh, boy. So, oh, um, so I grew up playing the classics, you know, Clue, Monopoly, the good stuff. Stuff. I've been playing Magic since I was, gosh, I don't even know how long, since I can remember. And I didn't really get into these, like, super complex board games, I would say, until probably when I was finishing up college, right after college, my brother got into them and got me into those. I think I've played mostly the kind of coup or werewolf social deduction mm-hmm. games, which are really fun. I like those. It seemed like most of the games I play yeah. are the PvP, the player versus player. So when I get my hands on a really good co-op game, I just love it to death. Is that why you like Sentinels so much? Yes. Of Speaking the of, I've, oh man, i played a lot of Sentinels. Let me tell you, John. i played a lot of Sentinels. Oh boy, oh boy. Fun. I wouldn't say I'm an expert, by all means, but I have played a bunch. Anyway, Kindred Spirit Podcast. But <laughs> oh. <laughs> <laughs> Sentinels of the Multiverse is a wonderful co-op game that was done by Greater Than Games prior mm-hmm. to Spirit Island, and you can definitely tell the influences that they've had okay. from Sentinels of the Multiverse to this one. And so, allow me to interject, John, because, yeah, you've never Play the game. I'm not, I don't so, know. <laughs> he, they need it. to, though. Yeah. I have Sentinels of the Multiverse upstairs, and I just have to ask, have you gotten, like, all the things for it? My brother has everything. So I'm pretty sure. I'm trying to think. There's a possibility he's mentioned some kind of card that I didn't know about, but I'm pretty sure he has, like, all of it. The collector's he's box? The big box. Yeah, yeah. Yes, which giant... is 11 pounds empty, 26 oh when it's full. <laughs> it's a little large. Yes. <laughs> now, I have to ask you two things. Have you played Nexus of the Void? Uh, I have not. Because you just said you 
because I played it a lot because you know how in that game you pick your heroes, you pick the villain, and there is an environment that you fight in. Yeah, probably one of the coolest things that I've like ever seen is that Spirit Island has a cameo in Sentinels of the Multiverse. What? what? You can play on Spirit Island itself. That's one of the environments in what? Sentinels of the Multiverse. Excuse me, what? <laughs> Your jaw is dropped. Huh? Yes. And Check at first, out. when I opened up that expansion, I was like, you got to be kidding me. Because in that game, one of the things that's very important is the various keywords that your powers will have. Yeah. So, like, if you're playing Tachyon, you'll have a lot of burst cards. And she has cards that do bonus damage depending on how many burst cards are in her discard pile. And some people will have war gear cards. And if you're playing as mm. Wraith, she gets a lot of tech and whatnot. But Ra is someone who doesn't have those cards. So, various keywords. And one of the keywords in the environment deck are the various bosses that you will fight on this Nexus of the Void environment, and they have the spirit keyword. And who are they? They have Serpent, they have Keeper, they have River. Oh, it's what? great. What? I would love to go and in a later day, like, describe and go through them all to show you verbatim. And the artwork is, like, 2% changed. But besides <laughs> that, it's like, oh my word, we can actually play on Spirit Island. It That's cool. Blue my mind when I saw this. I was just like, oh, I was like, you gotta be kidding this is so cool. You what? can play it on Spirit Island goodness. in another game. Then, of course, same publisher, so it's like, yeah, yeah. oh, that's perfect. Like, what a great cameo. The other one is, what is your best A-team <gasps> oh, in that game? Oh, I'm so glad you asked this question. <laughs> okay, because I have a team of five. Some people like yeah. four or three. I have a team of five that is just like unstoppable for me. I'm I, curious what yours is. Because you often want to go with the team of five to have as many mm -hmm. teammates as you can, but I mean, it does change some of the right. Shows, yep. Some of the effects in the game are based on how many heroes mm. are in the game. And yep. so having more isn't always better. And so I kind of have my four main go-tos mm. and my one flex. Or they're kind of like, you know, yeah. switch in and out. But I always have Medico. Always Dr. Have. Medico. Love yes. him. My favorite deck of all time is Akash Thria. Yes. I play as the variant of Akash Thria, and it's just so incredibly powerful. Ooh. This will mean almost nothing to you, but... I know, we got to make this fast so that he Keep can... Keep going. Play. <laughs> We're playing. Because this is interesting. You come Completely <laughs> take control of the environment deck. You are yeah. now two decks in one. Uh, Akash Thry is actually a bad guy villain turned good guy. Ooh, and so, she's a tree. Yeah, the villain is actually called Akash Buddha, which is a villain who takes the environment and just completely indoctrinates herself with it and uses it against the heroes. But as a good guy, which by the way, she has the highest health bar in the entire game. Mm -hmm. It's like 50 plus, if so I remember correctly. cheating by using her. Well, a lot of her cards will damage her, right. but then do stuff based on Damage right. okay. But you can manipulate the environment tech for the good guys. Oh, it's great. And then I play as Mainstay. Oh right? my goodness. I yes. know. Mainstay is so good. And then I play as Tachyon, but I play the variant where everyone draws a card. Yes. How can you beat everyone yes. draws a card? Wow. And card draw is huge. It's better than everybody mm. discarding a card. Yes. <laughs> Lord, <laughs> nice job. I married you for your smarts. <laughs> So my team of five that is just so good. Oh my goodness. And we just have to play this in the future sometime. But Legacy, I have to have Legacy because that damage buff adds up so yeah. quick. So ridiculously good. You have to have Tempest for the group heals. Tempest is so ridiculously good. He can do everything. He does everything. I he like being seriously does everything. And he's like Love a it. weird swamp monster man. He's, he's Aquaman and Thor monster. combined. Oh, he's perfect. He was it's probably, so dope. he's one of my main, mm -hmm. like, fifth one that I swap in. Yep. Then you need to have Wraith because okay. she can deal ridiculously high damage to a single target. Okay. But she also has anti-environment stuff, which is really critical. Then I have the Visionary. I must have the Visionary. Oh. Because she can look at the bad guy deck before it's going to happen and be like, nope, don't want that. And she also has some of the most reliable shutdown of bad guy ongoing effects. Be like, nope, cancel. And Visionary is cheating. <laughs> <laughs> and then Omnitron X. Because oh, okay. Omnitron yeah. X has the adaptive armor. He's a robot. Oh. Who can, oh, what's my bad guy? The bad guy does a lot of incendiary damage. Let me just play the, oh, I'm resistant to incendiary damage. Nice. And just so ridiculously flexible. So, Legacy, Tempest, Visionary, Wraith, and Omnitron X. So, mm -hmm. that was an offer free. Sorry, not sorry. <laughs> Speaking of Sentinels, for Spirit Island, for you, did you feel more at home, Tim, just because of the whole co-op? and? Oh, definitely. Like you said earlier, Ryan, in that there's so much kind of carryover. It was a lot of the rules I was learning for Spirit Island okay. were just kind of second nature to me from yeah. playing so many games of Sentinels. Speaking of learning, how was it learning the game that we taught you compared to when you bought it on Steam? Because yeah. we've had a difficult game for your first game. I tend to do that, and I'm not good with that. I'm sorry. I think I mentioned earlier, some people are kind of 
forged in fire, if you will. They like to mm. learn things in like tough situations. And they like to people, jump in the deep end. Right. And some yeah. people are forged in pillow forts with lots of blankets and maybe bunny rats. <laughs> they like to walk in the deep end. <laughs> jump yeah, in. or maybe like walk through flowers. Who knows? I don't know. But I'm kind of more of the latter in that I like to start simple. I like to kind of get my bearings straight before I jump into something really tough. So Tim's first mm-hmm. game was with a Vendek adversary at level four and... I don't remember. I blocked it out of my memory. <laughs> no, obviously I had a great time. And, you know, I think you might be surprised to find out that, honestly, I did love learning it that way from you guys. Because, honestly, if I had tried learning it first from playing the Steam game all by myself, I probably wouldn't have stuck with the game, right? Um. Because I may not have really gotten the whole, what's so great about it. I mean, I know that you can play it on Steam and you can really get an awesome sense of it. But what I love is being there in person with my friends, mm-hmm. having that experience. And you don't get that just kind of playing at home. Oh, well, some people may. And I know you can play online. You can talk to people. Yep. But the Discord. lack of reading all the lore isn't as tangible mm. on a computer screen to me. Laura, you played on Steam for a bit during our initial quarantine and stuff. Mm-hmm. What do you think of that? It was kind of fun because you felt like I can try out anything and who cares because I kept that undo button on all the time. Mm-hmm. So it was really cool to be able to be like, I don't know what this card does. I'm going to try it there. Oh, that's what that does. Undo it because I didn't like that. And just kind of feel like my cards don't really matter as much because to me it didn't feel like a real game because we weren't like setting it up. So there was a freedom to it where I could just almost like kind of run around in the Spirit Island world and just see what happened with cards or difficulty or what have you. That is one difficulty adjustment you can do on Steam is the unlimited undo. So Mm -hmm. Laura could like pick her four cards, you know, gain a new card. If she didn't like them, she could just undo it and pick another (laughs) new four cards and just like keep going back. She's like, well, this isn't my ailments either. I believe it was difficulty negative two. Yeah. (laughs) I like how it keeps track of the elements that you currently have active. Oh, that was nice, oh, that too. Nice. I'm kind of a stickler for rules. Being a math teacher, I really, yeah. you know, it's all about these rules are what make math what it is. And the rules of Spirit Island are what make the game what it is. And it took me a very long time to get used to the idea of, like, if you mess up, that's okay. You'll just get it right <laughs> next time. And I think I was a little frustrated at first because of how nonchalant everyone was. Not that we were just <laughs> making them up the rules, but it kind of was like, I knew I made a mistake and I was like, we need to go back and fix it. You was like, the listeners no. know how much Laura cheats, don't worry. Oh, no. <laughs> yep. One of us is an art teacher where we're like, what are rules? <laughs> <laughs> rules are subjective. I just know like what the art. rules are, but if I don't want them, I'm not going to do them. <laughs> Ryan, you've talked about missing rules. It's okay. <laughs> it is fun when we're playing on the same side of the table and you're like, you can't do that. And I'm like, you are right. You are. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> but it was really great to get my hands on the Steam version because like you said, it didn't feel like I was actually playing like a real game. It's almost kind of like I treated it like the training room in Smash Bros. I love Super Smash Bros. Hey, you'll fit right in. (laughs) And so it was kind of like the training mode where you can go and just practice and like really get a good grasp of what the rules are. Just iron out kind of things like the order of turns and I was still kind of confused after the first few games that we played but just playing game after game on Steam I could just figure out exactly oh this is the order that things happen. And you play without a blight card correct? And uh, no adversaries. I and... have never played without a blight card. Oh. I didn't realize that was a thing you could do, and I can't imagine playing the game without a blight card, to be honest. Mm. I think I'm just I'm used it. to it. I like it. I think it adds a certain sense of, like, we have to take care of this island. Right. There's no incentive to actually mm-hmm. stay clean and healthy with an island without a blight card. There's no right. pressure. It's like, uh, Well, besides uh, losing your presence, but, I mean, you can still right. even circumvent that or avoid it. Right. Or bring instances. them back. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. I've heard everyone's opinion. Ryan, what do you think of, like, Steam versus physical. I have yet to complete a single game on Steam. Okay. <laughs> it sounds like you love it. <laughs> I have 300 hours playing on Steam. <laughs> I did that first little tutorial thing with River, and I'm like, oh, I can't stand this. Okay. <gasps> I can't. I hate the whole I have to click to see my hand over and over again. This mm-hmm. is just like one of those, the older I get, the more I know what I prefer. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Maybe this is pretty bad. I'm just getting more picky with certain things. <laughs> I hate the whole, all right, now let's go click to see the target land. Just do the thing. Yeah. Do the thing. I want to draw the cards. And the whole undo thing, I hate having to undo, 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 and take this other guy's turn again. Like, that is like (laughs) I've said it before I'll say it again y'all better listen up Every spirit needs their own undo button when yeah. you're in the growth phase. Yeah. So, like, there's a lot of bookkeeping stuff that I really appreciate, like, setting mm-hmm. up the whole board. But, yeah. I don't know, I kind of have fun with that, and there's something tangible with the whole boards. But I just really despise the whole, like, oh, let's check this guy's hand. 
<laughs> Put it away. Look at the board. What was my hand again? Click back up there. Look up, <laughs> click on the nates. <laughs> click on the nates. What was it? Like, I feel as if that process I can do significantly faster, like, in real life. And that's just a preference thing. Like I said, there's some things that are expedited. There's some things that are not as expedited. Yeah. So it's like, where do you want to use this power? <laughs> Let's go here, kids. <laughs> now, where do you want to push this guy? You just push him here, kids. By this time, you could have already been like, yeah, he goes here, he goes there. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. yeah. So I know that's kind of like a stubborn preference, but whatever. It's just... You liked using it to get to know the spirits better. Yes, definitely. Just being able to get more experience in a shorter amount of time, because yeah, I don't have a physical copy of the game. And so if I wanted to even just read the cards... Well, look if you're um, you. I, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I didn't buy you a copy. I mean, and so yes, I could go online and read the cards, but getting to see them in action, getting to see exactly how they work, because sometimes the wording can be like, does this happen before this? Does it happen after? What exactly does this mean? I can just load mm. up the game, use that card, and see it in action and that was really yep. a great thing in the learning process right and one of the things that's so great about it is that it will never be wrong yes it's that's not true. like i can use this yeah. card wrong and oh no sorry Oop, yeah i just did that one wrong or you caught a turn oh i've been doing this wrong the whole game like no it'll do it right we, <laughs> for yeah. you we call them steam rules whenever we're like debating in the physical <laughs> copy laura's like well in steam i'm like darn it you write steam rules well for sentinels of the multiverse the app that they have that is like the fastest way to learn the correct way the only problem is a lot of the time something will happen and you have no idea why it happened. So yes. you have to research why did that just happen and you're searching through all the cards in play. I have no idea why that just happened. Uh, and then you look, third paragraph on this guy's card. Oh, that's what happened. I think it'd be cool if there's like a question mark feature where like the game will keep a track record of every effect that happened mm -hmm. and you can just say, click the question mark and say, why did, look for the effect, why did that happen? Yeah. And then the game will tell you, oh, that happened because of level four of that guy's effect. The Microsoft paperclip mm. thing. <laughs> yeah, Clippy! Where's Clippy? Clippy! So one time I was playing on the Sentinels app, and I was like, all right, I'm doing pretty good. I was fighting Akash Buddha. And then in one turn, <laughs> all these things happened, I died. Yeah. Yep. What the heck just happened? And it was a thing that cascaded off of her playing an environment card that said, do this thing when this happens. Oh, and so whenever this happens, the villain gets to take another turn, and it happened all so fast. I was like, right. what just happened? So I get that it's a double-edged sword, but sometimes, mm -hmm. even though the card will always be played correctly, sometimes something will happen really quick. You're like, Whoa, ha, ha. what just happened? <laughs> so sometimes it gives you exact information on why something happened, and on the other hand, it happens so fast that I have no idea what just happened. So. <laughs> Laura, what? question for you. Yeah. Together, we've beaten some tough adversaries, sometimes even at their toughest, at level six, and it's been strenuous. So what are your preferences when it comes to difficulty with this whole episode in mind? <sighs> Uh, um, so <laughs> <laughs> but that's the first response. Speak uh, right, honey. <laughs> <laughs> Say the right thing. You love it. <laughs> I love playing the difficult adversaries. <laughs> um, nice, babe. There was a night a couple of weeks ago where we were actually playing with Tim, and we played a really, really hard one that Tim and I were actually both pretty grumpy about during we grumpy. the entire game. <laughs> um, I think there was what? a lot of just, like, side complaining. I think at one point I was told, please stop complaining. You're sapping all the fun off of this table. That's at me which with point, events. You asked me how I was doing, and I was like, well, you told me I couldn't talk if I didn't like it. Yeah. Diversity is being <laughs> There was a lot going on in that game that I... Do we want to get into that now? We'll, no, we'll like, unpack so that later. Let's we'll move on okay. from that game. But then we played a game that was too easy. I was playing Keeper, and I was like, man, I've got well, all well, powered up. Game Keeper. <laughs> and there's nothing to do, and I'm bored. So, somewhere in the middle, I would say probably, like, difficulty five to eight is where I have fun, but I don't like that feeling of, like, the whole entire island is going to die and there's nothing I can do about it, but I also don't like winning too easily and being like, I have massive powers and I'm going to pay nine to just get a guy off the board or something. Like, there's nothing to do. Mm, I either. feel personally attacked by that last comment. <laughs> <laughs> there's a story there. Tim should unpack that one at some point. Oh, but not here. Because <laughs> I'm not a medically qualified individual. <laughs> <laughs> Tim drafted Briny Deep. This was the... Talk about when you kill the one explorer. Yeah. Do you okay, so I have quite the history with the card Briny Deep. <laughs> I've played exactly three games where that card has shown up, and each time it has had a completely different effect that is mm. iconic and unforgettable. The first time it showed up, Laura played the card. I don't remember which spirit you were playing, but your part of the island was either. looking... You were playing Shifting Memory. Oh, yeah. yeah. We, she was banking on it. It was a five-person game, and your part of the island was looking not great. As Shifting Elements... Shifting Memory. Shifting Memory, as their board does. And I think this was maybe the last game we were playing that night, so you were getting a little sleepy. <laughs> And so you, we were like, Laura, do you need help over there? And you're like, I don't know, I'll 
I'll figure it out. <laughs> or you were whispering to John, and I was like, I don't know what's going on. And you're like, I got it. I got it. It's fine. I got it. So Tim's like, you know, very engaged in the game and doesn't want us to lose. And Laura's is nonchalantly just being like, eh. She's like, I'm going to kill everything. I'm going to destroy it. I'm going to destroy everything. And I'm like, okay, I think I get what she's saying. And so she's talking about playing this card. She's like, I'm going to play this card. It's going to destroy everything. I'm like, all right. It's going to destroy all of the invaders, right? That's what she means by destroy everything, right? I mean, she couldn't mean anything else, right? What? And right. so. <laughs> it's finally, possible meetings. I like how, you know, what we kind of do when we're resolving our cards is whoever has the biggest, flashiest play will go last. And so Ooh. we're all doing our stuff. And then John's like, Laura, are you ready? You ready to do your thing? And she's like, yeah. I had to wake and her she, up. <laughs> <laughs> she just grabs her part of the island and just flips it. <laughs> And I'm like, <laughs> it was the most dramatic thing I've ever seen. No um, announcement. I was just like, I'm like playing Grindy D. Yes. Yeah. And just I, picked it up and dumped everything off. You just alley <laughs> <the board. laughs> And so, oh my word, so much sass. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I'm the one sucking fun out of things, but all I could think was like, how are you going to remember where all the other pieces were? Like, what are you doing? Like, it was cool. It was fun. But what are you doing? What are you doing? And then I had to read the card. They're like, no, it destroys It the actually board. does the thing she just did. Yeah, yes. it destroys I'm the like, board. She's not being oh. a butt. <laughs> I did have to pick some cities off the floor. That <laughs> That was the first time I ever felt love. <laughs> I fell in love with this card. And so the next, I think it was a few games later, oh, I was playing as Bringer, mm -hmm. and I saw the card and I had to grab it. I had to. I was like, this is... I can't it. kill anything, but <laughs> I can I kill can't anything. anything. <laughs> and so, was this our really hard game? This was the really hard game. Yeah, yeah. We it played was thematic a, It was a very hard Ooh. game, and there's a lot of reasons it was hard, some of which was in-game, some of which... <laughs> was maybe because someone was trying to do a little achievement. An in-person... <laughs> own side quest. I wanted to do a no reclaim Starlight. So I... Hey, you so never told me about this. <laughs> he wanted I was to shaving do... it for the podcast! <laughs> <laughs> he wanted Surprise! To <laughs> it, it's not the strongest Starlight Bell I came to find. And, uh, it was the, not. The island was sinking. <laughs> and and I someone think, mentioned Are you playing no Atlantis Rising? <laughs> Basically. Someone mentioned No Reclaim, I think, what, 27 times throughout that evening? Well, I would pick up good cards and like, John, do you have that card? I'm like, not, not reclaiming. Right. <laughs> and they're like, John, we need to defend six here. I'm like, yeah, wins a Russian edge if he's good. Back to Tim's story. But, and so... <laughs> My most of the time when Briny Deeps is played, your board looks like a mess. It's mm. basically just not good. And so that's where it was. I had a board with four deserts, and we had desert after desert after desert after desert, and I just was like blighting all over the place. It was a nightmare. It's technical cold sands. Just whatever. I'm just kidding. Well, <laughs> what? It's on the thematic board. <laughs> just kidding. I played the card. <laughs> I played Briny Deeps and I accumulated, was it 49 fear? 49 fear. <laughs> in one was... card play. It was pretty cool. But not only that, it's because. Let's grab it... a few fear cards. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and we won. <laughs> we, we did didn't. win. <laughs> well, we didn't we win did, after that. that we didn't win after that. No, no, no. It jump started our fear yeah. collection. Well, finally. the neat thing about that is because you get to push all of the towns and explorers. But not the cities. But not the cities. And so that was tough. But I got to basically funnel them into like two or three big problem lands but then we got to like ignore them and whatnot or I think you came in with I was playing a No Reclaim Starlight oh, yeah, you were playing Two Spears <laughs> you were also playing uh, River River and you came Aww. in just kind of yeah. <laughs> so that was the second time I played the card and then we played a game after that where I was playing a Slow Larry one of my favorite spirits so. Slow Larry is Earth to Tim yeah he used a lot of slow cards that's when you ever played right I believe so yeah that's the first spirit we I ever played we gave Earth to Tim and Earth so did. I decided to go <laughs> yes right Ryan loves her. That's my favorite low complexity spirit. I was playing, I call them variants because of Sentinels, but yep. uh, my Earth is probably my new favorite. <laughs> I think I was playing Resilience. Resilience. Yes. I really That's like Laura's resilience. favorite. So. Yeah, Laura likes Resilience. Because um, it's the first one I happened to pick up. Nice. John said you can't play them all at once. <laughs> <laughs> you can't make a Frankenstein spirit. Frankenstein spirit. So I went for the major powers. I decided to just go as much energy as I could. Yeah, resilience Earth specifically is actually really good. And for I was really struggling because every major power I got was due to damage. Every major power. And, and that was the only damage one's idea. And I just wanted where's to Where's my tsunami? Where's <laughs> my You had one of those wilds. Didn't you add three wilds one time or something? Oh, I got to add three wilds. <laughs> and so <laughs> thick and erupt with every touch of breeze is one of my favorite majors. See? I told you that one was a good one. It's not Big Bang But that one is Timber? good because there's a lot of things happening in the card. It does this and this and this and this. But it doesn't do like one massive attack though. 
There's no other way to get multiple wilds onto a land. See, at the I'm moment. I'm learning so much. <laughs> and so I found Briny Deeps one more time, <gasps> and there was one land that had like a million explorers and invaders in there. And I'm like, all right, sweet. I'm going to use it. I finally saved up enough, and I targeted the land, and it gets to the slow phase, and then I realized, because I have an issue with reading comprehension, <laughs> <laughs> that I could only target coastal lands, and it was an inland. And so I've been trying really hard lately. <laughs> To not do as many takesies backsies. <laughs> so I'm like, we're just gonna roll with it. So I targeted the only land I could target with one, one ex- explorer. <laughs> Nine energy, one explorer. No oh, royal yeah. yeah. right. It was the overkill yeah. of overkill. <laughs> it was beautiful. And, uh, did he survive or did that explorer? I don't remember. The explorer did not survive. Okay. Yeah, he somehow he didn't make it. So. Oh, my word. That's just like the bad luck Brian of all invaders. <laughs> like, everyone's looking at this Oopsie. one guy walking down the beach. This massive, like, thundercloud and whatnot. He grabs one guy and, all right, we're good. Screw <laughs> you in particular. Exactly. Oh, good memories. Oh. Speaking of scenarios and adversaries, which do we all prefer between the two? Or do we like doing both? Because Ryan talked about how you can stack the variables. Ryan, you've played most of the adversaries, I usually prefer right? scenarios over adversaries oh. for story reasons. I don't really care for having any one over the other as far as, like, I don't have a strong preference. Okay. But I like the theme that a scenario can give because they give more theme than adversaries do. Good answer. Okay. I dig that. But I don't care. <laughs> I'm just wondering, Laura. Uh, I prefer scenarios, except for whatever dumb dumb scenario we did during that hard one, because that was stupid. Oh, she didn't like elemental invocation. Yeah, I know the one that allowed us to get her. That was dumb, one. and it made, yeah. it made a messy board even messier. Laura doesn't care. like planning ahead, so she didn't want to like Don't. buy something and then plan to uh, use it in that. Very lands. crap at that. <laughs> but that I sense. love that like the Dahan one, playing Thunder Speaker. Um, we did that one where you're not allowed to talk to each other. So you guys do diversity of spirits? Sing yes. for the podcast! It was hilarious. That was funny. <laughs> that was the one where I destroyed one invader with nine energy. <laughs> oh, that one. So Gosh. we didn't know what was going on. He's like, killed this one guy. I'm like... <laughs> <laughs> He's giving this big thumbs up. I'm like, what are you doing? Scooping he up like showed me the card. I'm like, yeah, I get tokens. it. It's a great card. Why'd you kill one guy? <laughs> but we couldn't talk, so I couldn't swear uh, him. <laughs> <laughs> and so I've played Pretty only good. a couple of the scenarios. It was the last time we played that night when we played two in a row. I thought they were super fun. And in particular, the first one we played, where you could pay the energy to get an element. Get an element. Elemental invocation. But only in that element. one specific stupid land. Yeah, Laura, I, you plan. I mean, have you play Spirit Island. Like you have to plan one, ahead. If it's have you never used a slow it. power? <laughs> I do. I don't like them. She loves many minds. All <laughs> fast. That's true. Anyways, fast. Tim, back to, back, to Tim. back to Tim. I found that with Elemental Invocation, what I thought was interesting is like if that was just like a base rule but it didn't stay in the land and so like if you were allowed to just spend one energy to get an element of your choice like once a turn I feel like that would be a really powerful effect that people would use all the time and this is even better because you get to put it in a land and which means you can use it other turns later mm. and the downside for that was during the setup and so after a couple turns into the game you basically already forgotten about that yeah downside. we had to add like extra town yeah it was uh, the, take away like, an invader card yeah there's like set up things that yeah. change for it. But you don't really experience that as much as you really get to see like, oh, I can pay one more energy and get that one element I need this turn. And that's mm-hmm. what was able to get, get me. Get Briny Deep. Yeah, to get Briny Deep online. So, yeah. Uh, as far as adversaries, I don't like adversaries, <gasps> but I can't imagine playing the game without them, right? It'd be almost like trying to play Sentinels without a villain deck. It doesn't make right. any sense, right? right? And so when I play on Steam, I play without adversaries ever because I'm trying to learn. But that's like I said, my training mode okay. kind of thing. And so when I play in person, I do want to play with the adversaries because then I'm actually playing against an opponent and not just yeah. playing... Generic tra- bad guy right. number 35. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Ryan, you're doing a solo series. I know we don't want to like dive too much into it because that could be like its whole mm-hmm. own thing. But how are you playing? Are you in like any scenarios or adversaries or play card or what modules are you using? So I'm doing just base standard. Okay. Just complete standard across the board on all the things. So I don't have any adversaries series. I don't have any scenarios. I have a blight card in play. I don't do any bad guy extra stuff for mm-hmm. setup. I just do the exact just baseline standard because I want to have every game to be as close to the same benchmark as I can. Oh. And so with this solo series, I'm simply recording my own performance with
with each character. And so I can kind of see what turn did I win and what key details were in there. So I have various notes. When was victory attained? Was it Terror 2? Was it Terror 3? Was it a fear victory? How close was it? Did the island blight? I have all these things so I can see which was my best game. Now I know every game is not going to be the same because the invader deck is going to be, you know, one game it'll start with jungles, but maybe another time it'll start with wetlands. Mm -hmm. Like there's some variability, obviously, but I wanted to keep the benchmark as close as possible so I can just compare stats with the sample size and the constants as foundationally set as they could be. It's like having a controlled environment and a yep. scientific experiment or something. Yep. I mean, Tim, you sounds like you're doing similar on Steam. That's yep. exactly what I was doing mm -hmm. on Steam. I just wanted to try each spirit that I had access to just to learn their cards, to learn yep. how the game works. I started this series prior to the Blight change, and I'm going to finish the series with the original rules. Really? Yep. Okay. That, trying to keep the baseline. That's, yep, that's, that's the baseline. Blade. Right, because then I would either have to restart the whole thing with all the characters I've already done because now the baseline's not the same, or just keep going with the old rules. I can't wait until we can do a whole episode on that. Yeah. It's interesting to me, like, who you worked well with, I've heard some yeah. of the games, like I know you had a good game with memory. Just That was just insane. Yeah, <laughs> but that'll be a fun episode. Mm -hmm. I can't wait for that one. What about you, John? Events uh, versus adversaries. I like adversaries. I like taking a beating. So... <laughs> <laughs> so, I like the paint, and I know everyone's complained about... <laughs> That. <laughs> that. <laughs> I grew up playing Call of Duty and Halo and all these online PvP multiplayers. So I've just recently started going into like MOBAs and Overwatch and just more of a... Wait, you've been playing MOBAs? Uh, <laughs> and you didn't tell me? Save it for the podcast! Save it for the podcast! <laughs> so anyway, Hearthstone. <laughs> I'm saying, well, that's not a MOBA. No, it's not really a Okay, anyway. <laughs> I prefer adversaries. I think scenarios add a fun spin. It's just for some reason, scenarios just aren't talked about within the Spirit Island community. They're not like theory crafted or like, how well do we do Dawn Insurrection or Rituals of Terror? Like no one really talks about them in the message boards or... Right. Yeah, so, Tim, go ahead. It almost feels like the scenarios are almost like a party mode in some way. Hmm. Because, and maybe it's just because the scenarios that I played, I mean, we played the one where we couldn't talk to each other. If you feel like having a fun night, Mario Party style, you know, you can hmm. put in a scenario and... And it's like normal game, but now it's silly. Maybe some of them. I the would only say game? that that could be said probably for that specific scenario because that's <laughs> the change that feels the most gimmicky. You know what yeah. I mean? Like a lot of scenarios, you have an objective. There's nothing party about an objective. Oh, everyone has to shut up. Okay, that's a little bit gimmicky. We've yeah. all played a game before where it's like, oh, players pass their hands to the player on the left, or oh, someone yeah, has to go yes. and <laughs> change chairs or something. That's gimmicky. Everyone shut yeah. up. Yeah, it's kind of gimmicky. For yeah. that specific scenario, I could see it. Yeah. Yeah, I think it just comes back to my lesser experience with I've only played the two scenarios, and so 50% of the scenarios I've played have been gimmicky. It just happens that it's only the one out of how many scenarios are there? Editing Ryan. <laughs> <laughs> Help us out. That would be 13. Thanks, bro. <laughs> you may laugh, but I swear I'm not getting paid enough for this. Okay. <laughs> So Ryan had mentioned some new things that Jagged Earth introduced when it comes to difficulty, including adding extra boards and playing with double adversaries. I don't think any of us has done those. Would one of us want to do that? Like, is that interesting to anyone here? Like playing with an extra board or does that intrigue the room? I like that one where nobody's touching everybody else's island. Archipelago. Hey. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Adding another whole board. I'd like to try it at some point. I think I would like to make most of the modules out for that one just to try a very specific one I haven't done before mm -hmm. so Archipelago would be one an extra board would be another if I were to do the extra board one I might want to try that on Blitz Ooh, and do yeah. Mist and see if I can just yeah just get over <laughs> there that's so <laughs> fun <laughs> all slow powers are made fast oh and if it was fast already you then get money yep you get energy for it yeah so lightning's rich mm -hmm. and that's it's really cool do you it, have any favorite scenarios oh let me think so maybe because we've had good games I loved Rituals of Terror that Mm -hmm. Laura, Ryan, and I played, and that's where we had the 60 damage. That you know, was a fun game. It felt like we had to work together, Ryan, more, and Laura a lot just more. a lot more than usual. We're like, guys, well, we have to meet in one spot to do a ritual of There's an additional oh. pressure on that one because your win condition isn't as, oh, just do your normal stuff, and it will eventually happen. Like, this will not happen. The end game will
will not happen for the good guys unless you do this ritual a certain amount of times. You don't earn fear cards the normal way. Oh. No. And fear cards is like the way to win, whether <laughs> by making the terror level better or just getting a fear victory. So yeah. it's like the bad guys over time will automatically win by doing their normal routine. You will not. You must get this ritual of terror to happen. And if you don't, then the bad guys are just going to win. Ooh. So it's like the additional pressure, like, okay, we can clean up our lands and okay, we can stop this and stop that. But unless we're actually working on this really powerful ritual, we're not going to win. So we have to do it like, or you're dead. So you do not have the clock on your team. The clock is on the other guy's Oh, yeah. Team, it so. felt much more interactive. Than a normal game of Spirit mm-hmm. Island, because we just had to meet together and bring Dahan with us and then perform the ritual. So I really like that one. Lord, do you have a favorite? That one was really fun. I also like that one, again, with Thunderspeaker with Dahan Insurrection. Dahan Insurrection. I like that one. Probably just because I've had one good game with it. I don't think I have one favorite, okay. but there's like a few that I'm favored towards. I really enjoyed Elemental Invocation. Yeah. That one was a lot of fun. Blitz is usually my starter one for people who mm-hmm. have not played with one, just because it's probably the easiest to understand because a lot of new players if they're learning the game there's still a lot to learn and Blitz is like hey slow powers no more of those a lot of new players are like hey cool they can get on board with that it's just fast exclusively just completely fast that one's just fun that's like a turn your brain off kind of fun one oh, and it's like a party game <laughs> <laughs> we get it now <laughs> <laughs> although of the new ones that I really liked or at least when I played them the first time I was like you know that was really fun I mentioned Elemental Invocation yeah. but I liked Very Terrains yeah that one was good. Oh, that's interesting. Every that single fun. land yeah. in the game has a special effect that no other land in the game gets. Ooh. So mountains have a specific thing that happens on them, but sands has something else, and wetlands has something else, and jungles has something else. So it's not like there's some sort of thing that you need to do, but you just need to be aware of just various things. And I thought that one was actually pretty cool. Nice. So for instance, mountains, you add one explore additionally when mountains get explored. But that's exclusively for mountains. But jungles, after invaders build one or more cities in a jungle, you add a blight there. So you really want to stop builds on jungles. You want to stop exploration, but only on mountains. Sands, whenever blight is added to a sand, it will cascade, even when there's not a blight there. Always cascades. So sands are like these really dangerous battlegrounds. But then with wetlands, after invaders successfully build in a wetland, they build again. So So when it comes to jungles and wetlands, you have to worry about builds on jungles and wetlands. Sands, you have to worry about ravages. But mountains, you have to worry about explorers. So it was something that was really cool. It was very unique. Now that you bring that up, that might be my favorite. Yeah? That's a really fun one. It really puts a spin on the game. And one thing that's cool is you can toggle which one of those land things you want. So you can have difficulty one, two, three, or four with that scenario. Difficulty one, have one of those active. Your choice. Difficulty two, two of them active. Your choice. Mm -hmm. Three, pick one want to not be active, your choice. Difficulty 4, all of them are active. So that one was actually kind of cool because it was also tweakable. It almost felt like an adversary. Mm-hmm. But I have to say that my probable favorite of all of them would probably be Second Wave. <sighs> The legacy mode. Yeah. The campaign. Oh, I spoke about it. Oh, we did that, didn't we? (laughs) You were there for all three of the games, yeah. (laughs) (laughs) That we are still ongoing with. Yeah, we're still going through it. The experiences with Second Wave have just been oh so much fun. And if you want to hear just a little bit more about that, you can check our very first episodes, our first three episodes. Yeah, we talk about it. it, Does anyone have a favorite adversary? No. Okay. (laughs) Usually, whichever one we're not currently playing. (laughs) I would say no, only because there's nothing wrong with them. It's not like I have a favorite. It's just like one of those things where the Jaeger mentality comes in. Mm -hmm. Where it's, here's a bad guy. All right, well, that means I need to play a so-and-so, or I need to not play so-and-so. So, So it's like, well, going up against Hasberg? Okay, stone and wildfire. Mm -hmm. Going up against England? All right, green, where you at? (laughs) So, it just is kind of like, that's the rock, paper, scissors specifics that the game will get. The metagame type Mm -hmm. thing. So, if if I want to play Wildfire, sure, let's have Asperger. Why not? You know? Yeah. I like Scotland. Scotland seems... They're very different, yeah. to be sure. England just really warps the game with builds everywhere. And, and extra health, which and is And extra health, and then we've talked about Russia just and there. Well, you like Finder, so this does not surprise me. Wait! <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Wait, bad guys can't have cities on the coast? Huh, Finder's like, <laughs> no. Moves adversaries. Oh, wait, if they explore on the coast, they get towns? Oh, isolation. Fine, you caught me! <laughs> 
<laughs> I know exactly when the coastal lands are coming up because you build the deck. Nice. Isolate yeah. coastal lands. Isolate coastal lands. Okay, fine. Whatever. <laughs> we kind of talked on this, but does anyone have a bad experience about a too difficult game? Huh? It's time. <laughs> <laughs> Go Speaking ahead, of, Tim. actually. Honestly, calling it a bad experience is not quite accurate. I think there were some feel-bad moments during it, and I think it did become a little bit more frustrated finding out later that you were trying to play a mini-game inside of a game we were struggling <laughs> during, John. I was just memeing. That's you all. were doing a meme build into the hardest game we've ever played. I think the icing on the cake is I picked up Elemental Boon, and it aided your unlocking Briny Deep's Elemental Threshold. Which, so, in turn, got us 49 fear 49 in fear. one card. So, Tim, Tim's like, I'm going to save up for this again because we haven't won yet. Can you give me those three elements again? And I just said, no. Because I did a no reclaim and you were a bit salty about that. I, I think... <laughs> Because you weren't a team player. <laughs> I was doing my own thing. He I was wanted... doing a side quest. Ryan, I said I wanted to do a no reclaim. Ryan knows. The thing that I think... Defend me, brother. <laughs> this is going to be an inside joke now where wherever we ever have a problem with John, he's just going to be, no reclaim bill. <laughs> no reclaim bill. <laughs> Honey, why didn't you wash the dishes? No reclaim bill. I did it yesterday. I can't reclaim the dishes. Have the taxes been done yet? No reclaim bill. <laughs> I think what kind of... <laughs> now, once again, I mean, we were still playing a game. We were having fun and, like, hanging out with you guys. So it wasn't True. like, oh, I'm never coming back. But I think it was frustrating finding out, and I might be wrong in this, but you kind of alluded to the fact that not reclaiming didn't necessarily make you stronger. No, I think it's not a, just doing it for fun. It's not like by not <laughs> reclaiming, you gain something. If that was the case, I would have understood totally and been like, oh, I get it. You're stronger because you chose not to reclaim, but you specifically were not reclaiming just to say you did it. Yeah, I picked up some good cards that I wish I would have kept. And, like, I don't even mind you doing that in the game. (laughs) But this was a game Laura and I were struggling with. We were quite (laughs) vocal about it. We were very grumpy. (laughs) And so, like... (laughs) But uh, no (laughs) recon! We did win in the end, and we did turn it around, but I wouldn't say that. I mean, River kind of... I pushed some towns on your board, and then you got it. <laughs> those three towns. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. Wash away. But Wash I away. Think, I think there's something to be said about, you know, at what point is it too difficult? And this is going to be different for everyone, right? Yeah, everyone's but threshold will be different. If it feels completely unwinnable, are we still having fun is kind mm-hmm. of the question, right? Because, and I think I explained it in terms of, like, Overwatch. If you're new to the game Overwatch, Right, and you're trying to learn how to play the game, and as soon as you step out of the spawn, you get headshot by it, and you die immediately. You're not going to have fun because you're not even getting to play the game, and you're definitely not going to learn anything. And so, at what point do you push that challenge threshold? Because I did kind of jump in. Yes. Thanks a lot, <laughs> I did kind of jump in, and that's why I love getting to play Steam where I could actually, you know, play the game and not be like, I don't know what's happening, and now we are losing. Mm. And- yeah, I could take a page from Ryan's book because you do, Ryan, set up a good environment. Because obviously me and Laura, you were the first one to introduce us to that game. And now we love it and there's a podcast about it. So I do appreciate how you make it comfortable. But it is difficult enough. Like I thought we were going to lose that first game we played. But I'm sure you were like, we got this in the back type of thing. Which is fine. Mm. But I do like how you have set it up and I could probably learn from that as well. Because I think I'm very selfish. We're like, I don't want to know we're going to win. So I want to push it. And if someone is new, I'm just like, well, I'll give them Earth. That's a little complexity. <laughs> and I'm not like throwing them in the deep end too much. I mean, we won that game and I had fun playing Earth. And obviously I came back for more. Yeah, so yeah. it did work. So I'm me. right. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, no, he's not right. <laughs> I do think Ryan's strategy is probably just, I mean, Ryan, you've talked on it. Oh, yeah. But I love how Laura put it earlier about how you don't want it too easy either. I don't remember what I said about that, but I agree with it. <laughs> I was like, what, uh, 20 minutes ago? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, generally speaking, ago. I like to keep it as normal or on the easier side of things so that you can guarantee a win with easier difficulties for newer players. Mm-hmm. That way, they can get bit by that bug and they can come back at their own pace. They can either jump into the deep end or walk into the deep end. Some people like to just jump in, plunge, cool, go for it. If you want to do that in your own game, sweet and some people if they want to walk in yeah also cool but for the first game i'm not gonna be like here's my preference now it's yours <laughs> man. I'm just, you know. i gotta learn from that i mean mm, i definitely. think you teach it incredibly well john so Thanks, when babe. you drop them in the deep end they do no have a concept. Right there, well they have a concept <laughs> within 20 minutes of here's the game here's how to play it so they're prepped pretty quickly so we're not spending like four hours trying to figure out what a slow power is but yeah let's make them a little bit easier all right fine is this an intervention or yeah. <laughs> 
this turned into a tech, so... But still, I'm the best teacher I've ever seen teach the game, so... You're married to him, you're buddy. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I know when he's wrong. <laughs> <laughs> All right, what is our preferred playing styles? We'll wrap this up. What do we like to land in? Laura kind of already talked about it. Um, oh, yeah, I said four to eight. Yep. Ish. Ryan? I generally liked single digits. Okay. Anywhere in the single digits. So that can be one, I'll have a ton of fun. Yeah. Nine, I'll still have a lot of fun. Okay. Double digits and beyond is where it starts to become work for me as opposed to just lackadaisical fun. But I have enjoyed many games that are really high difficulty, but that's going to be my exception where it's like, all right, let me mentally prepare for a game where I want to do something. All right, let me figure out what adversary we're going to do, what scenario we're going to do, and let me think for a hot second what spirit I want to be to just pick for that scenario. If I just want to play this character and I don't want to think about stuff, I'll just do a single digit difficulty game. Okay, Timmy. I think for me, because I don't exactly know how everything translates into like the numbers for difficulty. I'm going to give you more of a grocery list kind of <laughs> answer in that, you know, I, I always play with the blight card. I can't imagine playing without it. Although, obviously, if you play without mm-hmm. it, that's cool. Yeah. I like the idea of having that pressure of, you know, we really got to make sure we keep this island. Yep. I need to have a blight card. Yeah. As much as I don't like them, I think that I would pick that we play with an adversary. Maybe not play all the way at like no, six, six. You can do base right? difficulty or like, level one or something. Like one or yeah. two, yeah. I think is pretty good because I like the idea of having the adversary really changes how you you play the game. Each game mm-hmm. is drastically different between the adversary mm-hmm. because it's like where your focus is. We got to focus on explorers or we got to focus on cities. I love mm-hmm. that aspect of it. It's going to make each game way different than the last. And then I might not be popular opinion here. Yes, event cards. Oh, whoa. Ooh. Get out, Ryan. I <laughs> take him as a great with Ryan. I was wrong on that. I, I, I thought so you were just going to agree with you too. Somebody complained their head off. You about do the complain about events. events. No, I, you complained to me about events. I. It's a joking fun complaints. <laughs> right? Those exist, right? No, right? Dude, I always play with events with these guys. Mm-hmm. It's like a more prestigious thing. Like, I hate these things, yet I still play with them. It's kind of like a measure of friendship kind of thing that they never oh. tend to me, but, you know, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> we bought you Snapple one time. I just <laughs> walk in the room and I play whatever's on the table. Don't drag me into this. Yeah, apparently she never knew that she played on D-board every time you played Ocean. Didn't know okay. That. I'm sure you told me. We're okay. learning a lot today. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I found that the events, I always feel like, even though they always have some kind of negative, they generally have some kind of positive, and I think it kind of evens out. I generally have bad luck in a lot of games, especially dice games. Don't get Boy, me that sounds started. Familiar, yeah, we, <laughs> and yet, somehow... I need to shuffle better. <laughs> maybe I'm lucky, but these event cards have never been really terrible to me. Obviously, there have been times where it's just like, mm. this is the worst event we could have gotten. Beasts, R.I.P. Oh, no. <laughs> that was the one that stuck out. Oh, Strange man. Strange were playing as, oh. He was playing as Fangs once. Ryan oh. was playing as Fangs. All of his beasts got wiped off the board oh, by an event. Right. We had a decision to make where option A is really good for Ocean, but it's terrible for Fangs, mm-hmm. but option B is great for Fangs, but it sucks for Ocean. Yeah. And as a group, it was an odd-numbered group, and so we knew that we weren't going to have a tie, and so everyone voted to help with Ocean. I had to vote uh, for Laura. Yeah. And as a result, the, the thing that was bad for me for was me. I lost like <laughs> seven to eight beasts oh. across the board. And when that is your damage, that is your mm-hmm. thing, it's like... Oh, See, all of your powers, you don't have an ammo. I have an ammo, and you just chucked it. Of course, we still won. It was just simply, it helped her, which was nice for her coasts and whatnot. It was just bad for me. But it doesn't feel so great when it's like, hey, you're doing something good for the team, buddy. Yay. Yeah, thanks. I sure am. And that's the last thing I'll do in this game. (laughs) (laughs) Consolation for us. There have been so many times where I have everything planned out, and I'm looking at a land, and I'm like, that's definitely going to blight this turn. But wait, we have an event. And uh, there have been times where events have saved my butt, and I've been like, what? No way, this event. And so Fear those, cards do that too. Yes. Yeah. But sometimes it'll be the event. We have no fear lined up, and the event mm. will come through, and I'll be like, yes, it was all worth it. All the pain is gone. Events, <laughs> thank you. I paid I'm 10 say, to say all this. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I honestly, we've played so many games with events that it seems kind of mainstream for me. And yeah, I, like the, I feel it. The mainstream thing. like It's the normal thing. I, I see these emotions yeah. on the lips and faces of pretty much every player who talks about it. I just wish I could be a part of that world because <laughs> they are person. always unlucky for me. Just I have the worst luck yeah. in the world. It's like, here's my thing. I'm going to go over here. That's dead. Okay. <laughs> I'm going to move to Han over here to do a thing. To Han. Okay. 
Have you I'm played... gonna go over here and it's okay. Just like... Have you played that potion game? Quacks, quacks, and quacks. Quacks. quacks, quacks. So speaking of bad luck, <laughs> this is a Spirit Island podcast. Anyway, this is a Spirit Island podcast. <laughs> Don't play quacks, <laughs> or do if you. Oh, I have luck in luck. other games. You do not with a now the event deck. I liked this conversation because I think within the Reddit BGG Discord community, it tends to skew very high difficulty. Sometimes it's not as well. Welcoming, I think, to a more casual gamer. Even if you're a veteran, like, you can play hundreds of games, but you just, like Laura said, one or two difficulty. I think this kind of gives more of a voice that there are people that can play this game and just have fun, not at level difficulty 17 or something. I can play the standard game with none of the expansion content and Mm -hmm. have a ton of fun. Sure, I'll have a lot of different kinds of fun with expansion stuff, but you can just give me the base game. I'll be like, this is great. Yeah, and that's what's amazing about this game that, Ryan, you talked on the beginning, just like how many ways you can make this game your own. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. I think that was just a really cool thing that we all highlighted. So I love that I can play the game now in the easier kind of gameplay and really enjoy and feel super powerful. But I also know that at any time I can decide next game, I'm just going to play a really hard game. Like I think it's so cool that I have the options. Any game I play, I can make it as easy or as hard as I want. I think it's nice knowing that I can just ramp it up. Yeah. Yep. Replayability is incredible. I mean, there's people on Discord that play two or three times a day and they've been doing it since, you know, so. 2017. Mm-hmm. The amount of times you can play and every single game be different is astonishing to me. Good job, mm-hmm. Eric Royce. And all the people. We've said it before. Yeah, all the people. The whole involved. team. Good job, everyone. Yeah. All right. I think that's good. Go. Anyone have any other thoughts? Final good, thoughts? Good stuff, guys. Yeah, yeah, thanks for talking. Thanks for coming on, Timmy. Yeah. Hope you thanks enjoyed your stay me. here on the KSP. <laughs> One, two, three. <laughs> yeah. Laura, thanks for coming back. It's been a minute. <laughs> it has been. It's always just fun to be here in the room, even though I don't have a lot of, like, deep thoughts. I always feel bad as the solo woman who comes on this podcast. I don't represent the women very well. So I'm like, <laughs> I've forgotten. I cheated. <laughs> <laughs> You're a very good player. But it's fun to be in the room where it happens. So There you go. Cool. Well, until next time, guys, we will see you on Brandenburg Prussia's first episode next Ooh, week. Ooh, and that is an epic game that we had. Don't give them spoilers. Uh, it was a terrible game. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing happened. <laughs> anyway, guys, thanks for listening. We'll catch you on the next one. Bye. Farewell. Bye. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Kindred Spirit Podcast. We appreciate you taking the time to do so. Feel free to visit us on our Instagram and Facebook page. You can find me on our Facebook page at the Kindred Spirit Podcast. To get a hold of John, check out our Instagram page at the KSP123. We look forward to hearing from you and seeing you in future episodes.